I'm trying to make an impossible pottery piece. For years, I've dreamed of making a glowing Chinese lantern out of porcelain. However, this kind of votive is typically made with molds, cutouts, or plates, techniques I didn't want to use because they would ruin the aesthetic of a lantern. Instead, I'm trying to create a porcelain piece so thin, light shines through. I knew it would be hard, since it's my first time ever throwing porcelain, but it would turn out to be even more challenging than I expected. <gasps> oh my gosh. I wasn't sure how porcelain would be to throw, and while I found centering it to be very similar to throwing stoneware, it felt more stiff, like it didn't want to be moved or pulled upward. This porcelain was also a little dry to start, so it was harder to center, harder to pull evenly, and required more water, which is dangerous for porcelain because porcelain is known to sag more easily, so you have fewer pulls to get it to where you need it to be. When you add too much water when throwing, it weakens the clay and makes sagging more likely. And when clay is dry like this, opening, pulling, everything is more difficult because you need to exert more pressure to get the clay to be even. In throwing, we have two basic shapes, a bowl and a cylinder, and the base of this lantern shape is a cylinder. The goal was to throw a really tall cylinder, about 12 inches tall, and then adjust the top and the bottom to make it look like a lantern. If I wasn't able to get the height I needed, I would end up with a really stout lantern, and that wasn't what I was going for. Because this votive was so tall, I wanted to separate the top and bottom so that I could easily put a candle inside at the base instead of putting it in from the top. This meant two things. One, this piece needed to be two parts, and two, the junction of these two parts needed to be at the bottom. Putting the joint at the bottom is a bit risky because there's a lot of weight up top, so it could be too top heavy or warp when firing. This is why people usually use plates when making this type of votive. In addition, porcelain has to be paper thin to allow light through, and I knew that the two piece structure I wanted would never work with walls that thin. So I decided to carve a design into the walls that would thin out that section of wall, and light would, theoretically, shine through that carved pattern. All this to say that the thickness of the clay here is really, really important. I have to get the width of the walls just right, thin enough that the light has a chance of shining through the carvings, and thick enough that the joint interlocking the top and bottom parts wouldn't collapse. As I work on these various parts later in the video, I'll show some diagrams to explain what I'm doing. As I was pulling, it started to wobble here, and I wasn't sure it would make it. With stoneware, I knew I would be fine, but porcelain was new to me, and I wasn't sure if it would slump or sag or fall over. But we made it, and I was able to color it in and form the lip. Between these two steps, I had also taken a rib to the outside to take off all that extra slip that can cause it to sag. So you can see the sides are more dry than the part I'm still working. The shape wasn't perfect though, and I had a feeling that it was still too thick. It was a bit uneven at the top still, so I had to take off that ring of clay. Using a needle tool, I was careful to not damage the lip and make it even more uneven, which would make further steps much more difficult. After cleaning up the final shape of the shoulder and thinning out that part just a little, not too much, I began to worry about removing the piece. 
This was my first time removing a porcelain piece from the wheel, and I wasn't sure if grabbing it would deform it. If I had thrown it too thin or took too much off the sides when cleaning it up, the pressure from my hands grabbing the piece would definitely warp the piece before it was even off the wheel. To make removal a little easier, I took a ring off the bottom so the wire could slide under the piece more easily. This was the moment of truth. If the bottom was thrown too thin, the wire would slice right into the bottom and I would have no base. But success! Bottom intact and the piece came right off. The next day, it's time to trim. This diagram illustrates the current shape and what I'm trying to trim it to. The goal of trimming is to thin out a piece and refine its shape. It's difficult to throw really thin because a piece can collapse on you while it's still wet. So we trim once the piece has dried to what we call leather hard to get the thickness we ultimately want. This typically takes about a day or two, depending on the moisture in the air, the humidity, how cold your room is. So it's very important to monitor the clay while it's drying. And I was worried about not trimming it thin enough because then no light would pass through. I really needed a thickness of about five millimeters, which is basically impossible to gauge down at the base where I can't feel the thickness. At the top, it's a lot easier because I can pinch the clay between my fingers through the opening. The piece was also a little dry, having sat out all day the day before. When clay is really dry, trimming becomes really difficult and you get what we call chattering lines and squeaking tools, which sound kind of like nails on a chalkboard, which is not really the look or sound I was going for. I had to trim very slowly because one, the piece was very dry. Two, I was worried about taking too much off. And three, I didn't want to accidentally knock it off where it was glued to the wheel. As you can see, I didn't add clay to hold this piece down because I wanted to access the entire side. So the piece is held to the wheel head by clay slip, which is very strong, but can definitely be knocked off if you're not careful. One of my favorite things about trimming is how much the shape changes from beginning to end. Almost every time I throw a piece and I show my husband, he's like, oh, that's nice. And then I'll trim that same piece the next day, and after he'll be like, wow, that is art. That's the power of trimming. It can take a piece from being just okay to being truly beautiful. almost like a sculptor chipping away at stone, unveiling what's been hidden inside. It's always been there in his mind's eye, but nobody else can see it until all that extra stone is chipped away. It's the same with clay. We have this vision, we see what this thing can be, what we want it to be, but it's not there until we've trimmed all the excess away. The shape was still very rounded in the center, so I had to keep trimming that part down. The only issue is that if it's rounded on the outside, it's rounded on the inside, so trimming too much from the outside can make the center too thin, and I would have no idea until the tool had gone straight through the piece. 
As you can see here, I'm trimming mostly the top and center. I wanted to keep as much of the base as possible for as long as possible so that it was less likely to detach from the wheel. This means that a larger ring of clay is developing at the bottom to be removed at the last possible moment. Finally, it was the shape and thinness I was looking for, and it was time to cut. Cutting this piece was the first time I would know if I had trimmed it well. It was the first time I would know how thick the piece was at the bottom. And if I didn't cut it carefully, the separation would be super uneven, at an awkward angle, or the top part could fly off the wheel. So I always wrap my hands as much around the piece as I possibly can, prepare to catch the piece as it disconnects from the bottom. I also move the wheel and my needle tool very slowly so that I'm digging into the piece slowly and the piece is moving around very slowly so that when it disconnects, it will be very slow. A little shaky, but it worked. And it was just the right thickness. I had left enough to carve a groove where the two pieces would attach together as shown in this diagram. This diagram shows how I plan to cut the base for the pieces to join together. Once open though, and I was cleaning up the bottom, I noticed that there was one section of the wall that was a little thinner than the rest, and once I cut my groove for the connection, there was no wall there, so I had to patch it up. In order to patch up the wall, I scored and slipped the base, then joined it with moist clay to create more base. When you're hand building, this is how you hand build. You add clay to the parts that you need it, and then you can carve it away. So that's what I did. I added the clay and then I carved it down again. This is how I patch a lot of things. It's definitely not a perfect solution. If not joined properly, there can be air gaps between the new clay and the old clay. Or if the clays are two totally different moistures that don't acclimate to one another, a crack can form and only get worse over time. But it's usually better than not fixing it. Once the inside was done, it was time for the bottom. Before removing it off the wheel, I wanted to take off as much of the base as I could. This relieves the pressure placed on the now very thin joint when I turn it upside down. If it's too heavy and the joint is too wet, it could collapse and then I would have to make a new base. <laughs> 
I'm very careful here though that my trimming tool doesn't touch the wheel because that will both blunt my trimming tool and damage and scratch up the wheel. I'm not trying to make the perfect shape at this point, although it is easier to see what the final shape will look like when it's right side up. I'm just trying to take off as much clay as possible. <coughs> then I use my metal rib to disconnect the piece from the wheel head. Before finishing the bottom, however, I had to make sure the top could attach to it, so it was time to work on the top part. I flip the piece upside down and I am able to clean up the piece and make the inverse groove in this top part. Grooves are difficult to cut from tall, thin pieces. There's very little margin for error as the large piece is undulating underneath your hands, going in a circle. If your trimming tool is at the wrong angle, or if it's unstable, or if you lose concentration, you can easily nick the groove you've been preserving. And you'll either have to patch it up or cut it down and start over, both of which suck. So this, like trimming the body, was pretty slow going. I forgot to film this next section, but this diagram illustrates what I did, which was to finish trimming out the bottom and then adding clay to extend the foot to match the top of my lantern. Then I could connect the pieces. While I was carving the groove of the top part, I kept testing it with the base to make sure they fit together as perfectly as they could. This required many tries and continuous trimming, but finally it fit together beautifully. Now to try carving for the first time. I had never drawn ginkgo leaves on a rounded piece like this before, so it was a little awkward at first getting the dimensions right. But as I drew, I gained confidence, and carving it became easier because I had an outline and I knew I could draw them freehand. We draw on clay with pencil because when the clay fires, the pencil marks will all burn off and it won't leave any traces behind. So there's no need for an eraser or cleaning up the pencil marks at all. I have been dreaming of this pattern for a very long time, so it was amazing to actually see it on clay. You might also notice that this lantern is upside down, so I was thinking about how it would look right side up as I was drawing. Once the initial sketch was done, it was time to start carving. And I started by carving out the outlines of the ginkgo leaves. Once I carved the outlines, I made sure to put the whole piece back together and see if the piece felt balanced overall. Unfortunately, I couldn't flip the piece right side up and spin it on the base because the foot was still too wet. So if I had set it right side up, the foot might have collapsed or deformed and that wasn't worth it. But now it was time to carve. This being my first time carving, I really knew nothing 
I didn't know how dry the piece should be. I didn't know how to hold the tools. I didn't know how deep I should carve the lines. I didn't know how to make it more ergonomic for myself. And again, I wanted it really thin. Thin enough for light to shine through, or else the whole point would be defeated. But too thin, and it would look broken, or I would actually poke a hole through the piece. I wanted the texture of the leaves to shine through, not to have gaping holes in the votive. This day that I was carving, I was in a rush to head home, so though I was quote unquote finished, it felt unfinished, it still felt too thick. So the next day I came back to the studio to thin it out even further, but of course it was a little dry, and that's when disaster struck. <gasps> oh my gosh! When testing the thickness of my top ginkgo leaves the next day, I accidentally pressed too hard and poked a hole straight through my piece. To patch the hole, I filled it with what I thought was porcelain slip, but it wasn't. So when I came back the day after that, we're now talking day five, I found that the slip had dried to a different color than the clay body, and the crack had worsened. I wasn't absolutely certain. Sometimes clay dries slightly different colors, but even after firing, it remained a different color, and that's when I knew. We're talking seven hours and five days into making the piece, and it was effectively ruined. The whole point was to make a porcelain, aka very white, votive. This stoneware slip would always look like a patch on my piece. But then I came up with a solution. I would paint the leaves. This would hide the color discrepancy and crack, and would still allow light to shine through if the glaze wasn't too thick. I hoped anyway. I mixed up some blue glaze and applied it into the grooves of the ginkgo leaves. I wiped off the excess so that only the leaves would have color. My goal was to highlight the veining and texture of the leaves without making them completely blue. I had never painted a piece before, and I wasn't 100% certain the light would shine through as effectively. But what choice did I have? I figured it wouldn't hurt to try. As I'm glazing, let me explain a little bit more about what happened with the hole. The first thing I did was to add moist clay to the hole, which is a little bit risky because moist clay has moisture and that clay that was cracked was so dry. So I knew there was a chance of it pulling apart. I also added slip, which is effectively dry powdered clay that has had water added to it, so it's very, very moist. The moisture of the slip and the new clay, compared to the moisture of the very dry clay, they couldn't get to the same moisture level, and therefore when it dried, it pulled apart. This is what causes cracks generally, actually. The speed at which the clay dries is different, and so it pulls away from each other. If the clay body had been less dry, this wouldn't have been a problem, and the patch would have worked successfully. After that failed, I don't know why, but I thought adding more slip might fix the problem. Sometimes slip can fix cracks, even when it's super dry. It just didn't happen in this case. The other thing that happened was that my piece is a porcelain piece, but most of the slip in our studio is stoneware slip. The first time, I had specifically made a porcelain slip to patch the hole. When I came back the next day, I thought I was using the same slip that I had already made the previous day, just adding water to it, but I actually grabbed a totally different slip. <laughs> 
I didn't realize my mistake until it was already dry and I figured adding a third layer of porcelain slip wouldn't fix the issue. All that to say that if you're going to patch a hole, make sure your piece is not too dry, that it acclimates well to the new clay, and that it's the right color slip. But happy accidents happen all the time. Painting this piece brought me so much joy, and I got to learn a new skill. And it turned out pretty beautifully, I think. Once I was finished painting, it was time to go into the kiln, and that would be the final moment of truth. Even though the crack had survived the bisque firing, the glaze firing goes to a higher temperature, so the crack could still worsen, or the patch could separate entirely. We'd have to wait and see. I couldn't wait for the kiln opening. The night before the kiln opening, I could barely sleep. I was so worried about the piece. But when I saw it in the kiln, my heart did flips because I was so happy. It made it out alive. Not only did the patch not fall off, but you can see here that it's pretty much entirely covered by the glaze. Of course, on the inside, you can still see the patch and a little bit of the crack, but that's okay. Unfortunately, there was now another problem. The connection of the top part had warped in the firing and the piece no longer fit together. Porcelain is renowned for being finicky and warping in the kiln. And because the groove in this top part was so thin and there was such weight on it from the rest of the top part, the groove warped and became almost triangular and didn't fit into the base anymore. Fortunately, we have ways around this and after a lot of drumming by the studio's assistant of both the top and the bottom, we were able to get the piece to come together again. You can see here how much we had to take off the edges, the outer edges of the grooves to get it to fit into the base again. And we also had to take off lots of inside of the base in order to get it to fit together. But it finally did, and we didn't have to chip off any of the groove in order to do so. I'd call that a win. The final moment of truth was whether light would shine through. So we brought over a tea light, lit it, and turned the studio lights off. And it kind of worked. You can see the parts on the piece that are the thinnest, the shoulder and the join and the ginkgo leaf where I poked the hole. The light shines through great there. All in all, it was a great first test, 
As always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.